Which actress had their voice dubbed and wasn't really singing during the film? Who did Zac Efron prefer kissing, Zendaya or Vanessa Hudgens? Here are 25 facts you didn't know about The Greatest Showman. The film opens with the tragic retelling of P.T. Barnum's childhood, where we see him get orphaned when his father dies. While Barnum's father did die, Barnum was never orphaned like in the movie, and in fact his mother didn't die until she was a shocking 83 years old in 1868. The Greatest Showman has become a triumphant musical whose message tells us to be accepting of others, and to love ourselves in spite of any flaws. However, would the real P.T. Barnum agree with this message? In real life, it seems that Barnum's views weren't so black and white, and that while he did hold anti-slavery views, he also exploited his freaks for profit, and held practices that made it seem like he owned the workers in his shows. While in the film we see P.T. Barnum recruit Charles Stratton, better known as Tom Thumb, when he was 22 years old. In reality, Thumb was recruited when he was only 4 years old. Not only that, but Barnum and Stratton were actually distantly related to each other. Tom Thumb and P.T. Barnum were lifelong friends and eventually business partners. Back when the film was being marketed, the most frequently used scene for promoting the show was when Barnum tried to convince Carlisle to join a circus. Barnum tells Carlisle that he has a flair for show business, and Carlisle says he doesn't know what show business is, prompting Barnum to reply that it's because he just invented it. This exchange was so prominently featured in the advertising for the film that many were shocked when they couldn't find it in the movie. The film was released at the same time as Star Wars The Last Jedi back in 2017, and was not expected to do well at the box office. Star Wars released to a big burst of success, but had fallen out of popularity in most countries by the time The Greatest Showman's release a few months later in February. The Greatest Showman had a slow start initially, but quickly skyrocketed in popularity after word spread of how good it actually was. It managed to stay in the box office top 5 throughout all of March, and even stayed in the top 10 until April. The only reason the film left theaters in April was because 20th Century Fox themselves had to pull it due to a contractual agreement. Not only did it have fantastic box office success, but the movie went on to have an Oscar-nominated song and the number one selling music album of 2018. The actor who plays the Tattoo Man actually has no tattoos of his own. A full bodysuit was used, as well as two and a half hours of makeup to apply the fake tattoos to the actor's face. The real-life Tattoo Man, who was also known as Prince Constantine, was covered in tattoos from head to toe and had a whopping total of 387 different tattoos that ranged from animals to shapes to writing. The love story between Zendaya and Zac Efron's characters was one of the major selling points of the film. Zac Efron actually said in an interview that his kiss with Zendaya was his favorite kiss of all time. Unfortunately, Ann Wheeler and Philip Carlyle are some of the only completely fictional characters in the movie. Fans of Hugh Jackman will definitely know him as the iconic superhero Wolverine. In this film, Barnum's wife's family name is Howlett, pronounced the same as Howlett, which was Wolverine's real name. One of the conflicts of the film is the possible affair brewing between Jenny Lind and P.T. Barnum. In the end, Barnum rejects her, but at the last second she steals a kiss from them right as several cameras go off, leading to a drawing of the photo being published in the newspaper. While Jenny Lind and P.T. Barnum never had any kind of relationship or scandal like this, Barnum did have one photo of himself that he was embarrassed of. In 1864, a photo was taken in Matthew Brady's studio that accidentally showed Barnum ogling Ernestine de Fabier, a beautiful dancer. A few of the different freaks in the film don't actually have any speaking lines throughout the film. This includes the Siamese twins and the albino sisters. However, it wasn't always like this. According to Miche Petronelli, who plays one of the sisters, she used to have speaking lines, and apparently even had an entire improv scene with Hugh Jackman, but unfortunately, these scenes were all cut from the film. The actor who plays Tom Thumb is Australian actor Sam Humphrey. Humphrey is actually 4 foot 2 in real life, which is about 24 centimeters or a little less than 10 inches taller than the real life Tom Thumb, who never grew over 127 centimeters. In order to help sell the effect that Humphrey was shorter than he was, they had him walk around on his knees and digitally edit out his lower legs and feet. They also made sure to have the character sit a lot to have some sort of close-up where his legs would just be out of view. The Greatest Showman actually spent a whopping nine years in the development process. According to Hugh Jackman, this was largely because 20th Century Fox was unwilling to take on the risk of producing an original musical. 
That was until they heard the show-stopping song, This Is Me, which had been written by the film's lyricists on a two-hour flight on the way to the studio meeting. In order to get ready for the role of P.T. Barnum, leading man Hugh Jackman read around three dozen books about Barnum. Jackman even said that this film was the hardest he's had to prepare for other than Logan. The film features historical figure Jenny Lind, who was a Swedish opera singer credited with having the greatest voice in the world that could even make grown men cry. Lind was played by Rebecca Ferguson, but Ferguson herself has admitted that while she certainly isn't a bad singer, she didn't feel her voice could live up to Lind's reputation of being the best singer in the world. Because of this, Ferguson was actually dubbed over by actress Lauren Allred. However, to help Ferguson get into the role, she insisted on singing her song in front of the cast and crew while filming. Despite her insistence on singing in front of everyone, Ferguson was still incredibly nervous to have such a large crowd hear her voice. Ferguson later commented that co-star Hugh Jackman was the one who helped her gain the courage and confidence to sing. Throughout the museum scenes in the film, you might be able to spot signs that say, this way to the egress. If you're like most people and have never heard the word egress in your life, it's a fancy and infrequently used word meaning exit. Despite how it's represented in the film, Barnum's American Museum grew to be so popular that crowds would linger too much and cause backups. In order to deal with this, Barnum hung up signs saying, this way to the egress, to trick people who were unfamiliar with the word into exiting the exhibit and going outside. This really goes to show that Barnum was really just as crafty in real life as we see in the movie. Speaking of Barnum's Museum of Oddities, we see his museum struggle to stay afloat, and his daughters tell him he should get something sensational like a unicorn or a mermaid. This is actually a reference to the unintentionally terrifying Fiji Mermaid, which is a well-known fake oddity show. The supposed mermaid was actually the body of a dead monkey sewn to the tail of a fish. The Fiji Mermaid has since disappeared and is believed to have been destroyed in one of the many fires that ruined Barnum's collections. The film has 11 stunning songs that were all written by Benj Pasek and Justin Paul, who also famously wrote songs for the film La La Land and the musical TV show Smash. You might have noticed that the songs in the film stray away from using a more typical theatrical style of musical songs, and are very reminiscent of modern pop songs. At first this might seem weird given that the film's story takes place in the late 1800s. This was a very intentional choice made by Pasig and Paul, as the modern pop mixed with the antique setting of the film is a metaphor for how far ahead of his time P.T. Barnum was. He isn't stopped by the limitations of the times he lived in, and is constantly working towards the future and trying to make his own new world. The real P.T. Barnum had a variety of jobs in several different industries, all of which had differing levels of success, with most straight up failing. In an apartment scene near the beginning of the film, you can see several old signs lying against the corner of the room. One of the signs reads, Barnum Lottery, in very large letters. This is clearly a reference to one of the many businesses Barnum had, which include a failed lottery. During the film, Barnum gives his daughter Caroline an adorable wishing machine, which shows candlelit images of circus animals dancing and circling around them as shadows on the wall. While most of the audience easily picks up that this is part of what inspires Barnum to start a circus, but it's actually a callback to a much earlier scene in the film, where Barnum and Charity shine a light onto a chandelier as children and cast animal shadows onto the walls. Several times throughout the film you'll see or hear the word humbug. It's written in the headline of the first review Barnum's show is called The Circus of Humbug. Barnum is given a hat that says Prince of Humbug, and both Barnum and his wife use the word humbug multiple other times throughout the movie. This is a reference to the title of one of the books written by the real-life P.T. Barnum called The Humbugs of the World. The climax of the film includes a fire at the circus which was started by protesters. During the final take of this scene, an actual fire started on set when a light fixture broke and was caught in flames. Some extras who just happened to be firemen jumped in and helped control the fire until the New York Fire Department could show up. Director Michael Gracie actually left the cameras running and caught footage of the fire and sent it to the animation team who was doing the CGI fire for the scene. So when you see the fire in the climax of the film, that was all referenced off of the actual fire that happened on set. All of the costumes worn by the main cast were borrowed directly from the Fell Entertainment Group, who own both Ringling Brothers and Barnum and & Bailey Circus, making them authentic antique circus outfits. Fans of Hugh Jackman will know that this is actually the third musical film he starred in, with the first two being Oklahoma and Les Miserables. In the beginning of The Greatest Showman, Barnum can be seen as a young boy stealing a loaf of bread. This is most likely a reference to Jean Valjean, 
Hugh Jackman's character from Les Miserables, who was arrested and sent to jail also for stealing a loaf of bread in order to feed his sister's children. In some close-ups on Hugh Jackman, you might be able to notice a few marks along the bridge of his nose. This was due to him having skin cancer removed before filming, leaving him with 80 stitches and an order from his doctor not to sing. During a workshop with executives from Fox, Jackman managed to follow his doctor's orders and avoid singing right up until the final song from now on, where Jackman was so overwhelmed with emotion he sang without realizing it. About halfway through the song, however, he suddenly realized his nose was bleeding. Click the video on screen now for some more movie facts, and if you enjoyed the video, leave a like and subscribe if you're new to the channel.